my name's Roy Thompson. I head up Carpenter Box Financial Advisors. Today I've got with me Henry Wilson. Henry's an investment manager at LGT Vestra. And as we've done in this sort of format before, the purpose is just to have a little update on what's going on in the investment world. So what's happening at the coal face? So uh, a lot of people ask me about uh, investments in the Far East. And very recently, we've had some fairly significant developments uh, politically in, in China. So it probably seems like a good place to start, Henry. Uh, w- what is going on in China at the moment and how is that affecting markets in the Far East? And I guess, is that a reason to you know, look at investing more in that region or is it uh, a reason to be more cautious in that region? So tell us a little bit about what's going on. Yeah, so there have been kind of three main things that have caused the weakness in Chinese markets over the last couple of weeks. And the first one has been... Um, uh, the, the COVID situation, they, they've started to see a steady rise in COVID cases and, and they've been attempting to kind of do a, a zero COVID uh, kind of policy rather than embracing it and just sort of like the UK have done where we, we're accepting that we will have COVID cases, but we're going to try and vaccinate the population. Um, China have been going down the route of the kind of zero COVID policy and the, what they've started to see actually is that cases are starting to rise. So they've gone into some localised lockdowns there. The second thing that we've seen is that the macro data has been slightly weaker over the last few weeks and um, they, they, they've been tightening uh, monetary policy and then suddenly they realised that actually that they'd been beginning to tighten the policy too much and that the macro data started to get a bit softer. And then the third kind of nail in the coffin, probably the one that's been most relevant actually and most spoken about has been these uh, regulatory changes um, in, in the last few weeks. So. Um, what they've been doing is really been, it started off with the, the DD, um, the IPO, where they, where they told them they didn't want them to, to IPO in the US. They, still, they went ahead with it and then they, they, they gave them basically a smack on the wrist and it's, it's hit the share price massively off kind of 50% or so. Then they moved on to uh, some of the education companies that, I um, don't know if you're aware, but in, in China, uh, the private tuition business is a huge part of um, the way of life there. Yeah. Uh, all part of the kind of the, the strive to get up into the kind of from the lower classes up into the middle classes and, and from middle classes into the upper classes. And um, what they realized is that the, the, the CCP realized that actually the, the cost of living for the average Chinese person has become too high. And um, they were concerned that the things like birth rates had, had gone off the cliff. And so to, to to rectify that, they've realized that they need to lower the cost of living. And this is one of the things that they realized was actually not beneficial to society. So they've made uh, sure that um, essentially the long short of it is that tuition companies, private tuition companies um, are no longer able to be kind of profit making entities. Then they're, they're now kind of nonprofits. Um, it's still quite early doors in terms of like the scope of the regulation and what this will really mean for all of those types of businesses. But what it did mean is it was a really timely reminder that uh, their version of capitalism is somewhat different to our own. Mm-hmm. And the second thing that it really brings into focus is that, you know, this idea that the Chinese are not happy with um, foreign capital or, or sorry, sorry, foreign investors participating in the cash flows of Chinese businesses. So what they'd rather happen is that, yes, they're happy to receive investment from off, uh, sort of offshore investors, but what they'd rather do is get money into Hong Kong or is a sort of a Chinese listing, what they don't really want is uh, their kind of a big poster child uh, companies listing out in the US as an ADR or, or via VIE, which are two different structures that people have been using. So um, I think a lot of people are kind of taking, taking stock at the moment and really like sort of looking at what, what they've got in, uh, in terms of their exposures and, and particularly where those exposures are listed. So uh, particularly that's something that we've been doing is trying to understand, you know, from, our, from within our exposures, how much of it is, is US listed, how much of it is Hong Kong listed, and then within that, how much of it is at risk of, of further kind of regulatory, um, you know, um, updates that, that could potentially harm the share price. So I guess that, you, you know, what you're really describing is that the Chinese, Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, has got, it's quite powerful and, and has got the ability to uh, interject, I guess, in sort of corporate governance um, or corporate proceedings at very short notice 
uh, and make some pretty significant changes. And, you know, politically, that's a slightly different position. Yeah, you know, UK governments can get involved, but they, they have to go through perhaps, you know, a little bit more of a process and, and therefore it can take a longer period of time. Is there any other industries that the, the, the Chinese the Chinese government is sort of looking at to attack or, or, or support? How, how's that looking? Yeah, you're absolutely right that, um, you know, it's the speed of the change of regulation that is is terrifying, really. And it's it's something that in the West, you know, I bet they, they, they wish that they could kind of um, have the same level of power when it comes to, uh, for example, the tech companies where they've been talking about you know, getting rid of these big monopolies that we have in, in, in the US in particular. So um, absolutely, they're very envious of that. So I think that that segues quite nicely into um, the second part of your question, really, which is that, yes, absolutely. Um, it's, it's the tech industry that's really another area that people are looking closely at, um, particularly these kind of platform businesses. So uh, there was a delivery company called Made to Anne that um, were sort of found it themselves in the limelight around kind of some of their practices to do with um, you know, uh, employee rights and, and things like that. They found that one, they, an undercover employee who was actually working for the government, working for this company, did a whole sort of 14 hour day and only got paid six dollars for the work. So what they're trying to do is introduce a, a minimum wage there. So um, the, the tech sector is one that we think could fall under the scope of regulatory changes. Um, so that would that would mean things like kind of probably Alibaba, Tencent. Uh, but then also the property market is an area that they're a little bit concerned about. They think things have been getting a bit hot there. Again, that's been raising the cost of living for your average Chinese person, which is a big concern of theirs. Um, and then some of the, the platform businesses. So Made to One, which is a food delivery company, um, and some of these kind of financial the platforms that deal with uh, peer-to-peer lending, platforms that deal with um, financials. So uh, that, that brings us back to something like the Ant IPO, which happened in last, which was due to happen in November last year that got pulled at the last minute. Yeah. Um, because of kind of government intervention. So to be honest, it could be any any sector or industry that falls under the scope, but those are the mo- main ones that come to mind. So you've referenced there that, that you know, really they're, they're trying to act to control cost of living. Um, it's a good point. You know, previously on here, we've spoken about inflation. Um, you know, your view as a, an investment house is that that, you know, up until now has been fairly, you might call it transitory. It's not something, you know, it will ha- occur for a period of time and then recede again. Um, is that is that still the view there? Because uh, you know some people would point to some pretty hefty cost of living rises here in the UK. Property, a good example, linking to something you just said there about China, has gone up significantly in recent months. Yeah, it, it's it's another really good question. So uh, we still believe that on the whole it will be transitory. We think that um, the long term forces that are at play, things like debt, demographics, and disruption, are not going away. And in fact. Um, in, in many cases, they've just been more entrenched by what's happened throughout the pandemic. Mm. Um, but but our, our analysis shows that actually, um, you know, a lot of the inflation, particularly if we look at the US, is being driven by a small sector or a small subset of um, inputs that go into the calculation. Mm. So uh, one of the big things that's driving the uh, rise in inflation in the US is semiconductors. And the other big thing is kind of uh, re- the reopening industry. So um, things like Uh, restaurants, um, uh, you know, uh, hospitality, those things where people have got additional cash in the bank, be going going down and frantically trying to spend the money. And we feel that as time passes, the novelty wears off and the level of personal savings that people have accrued throughout the pandemic whittles down. There'll be less of that kind of the the thirst and desire to go out and keep spending down in restaurants. Yeah. Analysis has shown that the semiconductor shortage is getting better as well. So um, that's been putting a lot of pressure on, on, on in the car market where lots of cars now, uh, you know, the, the kind of the operating system is driven by semiconductors and that's really been exacerbating. So as we come through the year, we think that that will improve, particularly early 2022. Uh, we, we believe that that will be resolved by and large. Mm-hmm. And then, um, but we would say that actually, you know, when you look at inflation, it has to, you have to kind of understand and appreciate that there are different parts here. So largely we think it will be transitory, but there will be some bits that will be slightly more sticky. To give you an idea, in the UK, we're, we're clearly having to kind of decarbonize our economy um, and, and, and move away from this carbon-led economy to, to a more green-led economy. And um, we talk about, you know, there's been a lot of news recently about replacing these gas boilers in the UK. 
costs around 10 to 14,000 pounds to replace one of these gas boilers. So it's estimated to cost the UK around 12 billion sterling over the next four years. So that's obviously a cost that's not going to go away. Uh, and that'll probably feed through to, to us as the sort of household owners who have to replace those boilers. Yeah, and I guess a good opportunity for someone to make some money. So, um, you know, support <laughs> that notion that, uh, you know, new technology and that um, carbon neutral or, or you know, things that might be positive from a carbon perspective would be, um, you know, a good area to have money moving forward. So, uh, so that's really helpful. Henry, I appreciate your time. What we're really saying is there's a reminder in the Far East that, um, you know, the government have got a lot of power and can act quickly, uh, and that's causing a little bit of disruption. The inflation and the, the, the issue that they're trying to control there in the Far East is perhaps inflation or the cost of living. And that links through to what we've got. We're likely to see continued cost of living increases over the course of the next year. Um, and, and they may well reside as time goes by uh, in the majority of areas. But um, there's still going to be things that uh, moving forward, notably the, uh, the example you provided, that this going to add to our cost of living um, on, a, on a day-to-day basis. So, Henry, I really appreciate you taking the time to go through some of those. Uh, thanks for joining.